Hello, I'm Howard Dixon, Rock Island's European representative, and I'm joined here again by my good friend Connor Fitzgerald as we take a look, a bit of an overview if you will, of the maker John Manton with a special view on his dueling pistols from the Norman R. Blank collection. John Manton was one of the finest makers of the late 18th and early 19th century. He has made some of the best rifles, some of the best shotguns, some of the best pistols of all shapes and sizes, but he is perhaps most famous and most associated with the dueling pistol. And in front of me here, from the Norman R. Blank collection, we have a selection. Early flint, mid to late period flint, and percussion. Howard, this pair of pistols is from the late 18th century. Mm -hmm. This pair shows full stocks and flat butts that are checkered. Tell me about that. Well, Manson had worked as foreman for another London gun maker called John Fox Twig. Now, Twig, for his generation of maker, was one of the best in London, and again, famed for his dueling pistols. Mm -hmm. And this idea with the flattened butts here and the full length stocks was very much in keeping with that slightly earlier form of the dueling pistol. Now, for these which are 1793 um, in date, we have the checkering down the spines, the checkering on the flat sides of the butt, the checkering on the inside of the butt. Some of Fox's pistols wouldn't have had that, or they might have had one element of it that which was checkered. So this is, even though they're very much in the style of that earlier flintlock classic dueling pistol, these are already updating with new style features. So these exhibit Manton's interpretation in the 1790s yeah. of an earlier style. Absolutely. So this was in vogue at the time. Absolutely. But technically, we are still looking at a flintlock that hasn't really changed that much since its inception in the 17th century. What we have still are the barrels with a screw and breech plug with the hook to fit into the standing breech. But some of these developments that are coming through by now, again, some of them led by Manton, we have this semi-rainproof pan, you see, with these little grooves cut around it. Now, one of the issues with the flintlock mechanism is you are relying on a little tray full of powder beneath that frizzle for your ignition, which is rather subject to moisture ingress. Yes. Mm. So, you start seeing these ideas developing of how do you try and draw water away from your priming powder. And this is like typical of the that later 18th century with these grooves cut here. Whereas if you look at this later pair, which are 1816, you can see you've got these full cuts around the uh, priming pans. So there's no chance of any moisture or water pooling if these were out in the rain. Were these advancements done strictly for dueling pistols? No, good question, no. Um, you will see it starting to emerge on rifles, on shotguns, other types of pistols. But I think when you're looking at a weapon which potentially you're looking at to not only defend your honor per se, but actually save your life, you're gonna want the most advanced, reliable mechanism possible. You, you don't want, you know, the old term hang fire, we still use that today, or some people do in the gun world. Uh, which means that your flintlock cock didn't go all the way forward. It hung on the half cock position, therefore it's a misfire. And in a dueling situation, you want to know that the pistol you are holding is going to do what you expect, when you expect it, no matter what the weather. So from the late 1700s mm -hmm. to the early 1800s, you now have a recessed breech and detented logs. This is correct. Where does, where does that lead us in terms of like safety and reliability? Well, the patent breach, which was developed by Henry Nock and sort of first appears in the 1790s, so contemporary time to when these were appearing, um, offers a much more reliable uh, breach 
construction because it is a completely separate piece which is then screwed into the barrel uh, when it's manufactured, almost becoming like a, an extra piece between the barrel and the standing breech like we have on this pair. So this has its own chamber? Yes, which means because you can access at point of manufacture this chamber, you can shape it to give you the best burn possible yes. of the priming powder, your, your powder that's going to set the charge off. Whereas where you're making a barrel with a vent hole cut into the side and then a plug screwed in the back, you're much more limited on the shape and design that you can build into the pistol. Therefore, this becomes more reliable. And yet here in 1816, you now have a half stock and a bag shape grip. I think the bag shape grips, when you look at the shape of the palm of your hand, I mean, you just need to look at a modern revolver. Yes. The way that the grip swells towards the base of um, the, 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 uh, the pit revolver, mm -hmm. it'll sit in the hand more naturally, allowing a better grip. And I just think that this is, I mean, this, this is actually quite a narrow wrist and into a very gentle swelled bag shape on, on this pair of pistols. Some of them, you see, it's much more pronounced. Mm -hmm. A lot of things just purely practical purposes. Again, the checkering, inclement weather, wearing gloves. The pistol's going to sit nicely in your hand where you expect it. So, early 1800s, fashion also is practical. Absolutely. I mean, the loss of the full length um, stocks down to these half length stocks is. If you look at the way the barrel's pinned on this earlier pair, you have these two barrel wedges coming through, securing the barrel to the forestock. By well, this period, it works out you only need the one. There is no real practical purpose in having this full length stock and a second pin. These are so well anchored now. So sort of from this period where the pins go through, I mean, go back a few decades earlier than this pistol, and you're looking at very little loops with a, literally a pin, something like a small nail, holding the barrel into the stock. Whereas by this period, you've got these beautifully cut and polished uh, sliding pins with these slots cut through the middle. That they're just fabulous pieces. Of them. And yet, from this finely advanced flintlock design, technology has superseded it with the percussion guns. This comes around 1820s, certainly into the 1830s. This pair of guns is from the 1840s. Yep. Tell me about this gun. Well, technology never stands still. Even though the flintlock have been prevalent for 250 odd years, the percussion ignition system is a huge leap forward. This is more sealed, so it's more moisture proof. Absolutely. So. With the advent of the percussion system and the copper cap onto the percussion pillar, you dispense with this external pan. No matter how many water drains, roller mechanisms on your springs, detents in the lock, you are still relying ultimately on a small tray of exposed gunpowder right. with a flint, causing a striking that piece of metal and causing a shower of sparks to ignite the charge. The percussion cap, it's a huge leap forward. You dispense with all of that external risk of a misfire. Between this pair and the later pair that are percussion, architecturally, half stock, bag shape grip, they're similar. There's no great change in fashion style with the stocks. It's strictly the ignition mechanism that has made the leap forward. Correct. I, I think sort of certainly on the two pairs we have in front of us, I mean, there's a slight scale difference. These have just got slightly wider stocks, slightly thicker at the wrist. But uh, essentially, no, um, from this sort of ultimate development of the flintlock dueling pistol to the percussion dueling pistol, there's very little that you can advance beyond that. And 
you can find these being made, sort of these, as we said, of 1840s. I mean, you will find examples being made into the 1850s, maybe even as late as 1860 for some makers. Certainly by that stage, they're much more target pistols. They are dueling. But that's pretty much the last incarnation of the single barrel pistol until the advent of the cartridge loader. By the time these pistols came about, dueling was beginning to fade. It was indeed. It was indeed. I mean, you still see, that sort of, especially in continental Europe, um, dueling carried on much longer. Uh, you could still buy dueling lessons at uh, Gaston Renet at their galleries in Paris right up until the beginning of the First World War, where they, you were taught how to duel with a single barrel pistol. From the British point of view, which these are British pistols, so we'll stick with that, they're I mean, even during the uh, Peninsula War, uh, Wellington had put a ban on officers duelling. He was losing so many men to duelling that I believe he actually said that if people were caught duelling or intending to duel, they would be sent home in disgrace. And yet the Duke of Wellington participated in a duel himself. Yes, Very he did. famous one. He did. I think quite late on, and thankfully, I don't believe it was fatal. And I think one can certainly say that you would not have just kept your dueling pistols in their little box, or just in case you ever got called out on a duel or felt the need to call someone out on a duel. You would have practiced and practiced and practiced against targets with these. So essentially, yeah, these are the forerunners of the target pistol. Absolutely. And dueling is the forerunner of target pistol shooting. That's true. This wonderful selection of John Manton dueling pistols from the Norman R. Blank collection will be offered in our May premiere auction in Bedford, Texas. Please come along and see our wonderful new facility and we look forward to seeing you.